So today we're going to look at some uh, issues with problem images, uh, a few complicated techniques that are not that difficult, but some easy techniques as well. When you think about it, there's only two things that we're working with with digital files, and that's chrominance and luminance data, tone and color, white balance, and exposure are the same difference. So if you keep that in mind, a lot of this is going to make perfect sense to you. I'm going to open up these images here first. To start with, I want to look at this thing called the tonal range. I use this to check my monitors when I'm calibrating my big monitor and my laptop together. I'll bring this image up and take a look at the dynamic range, if you will. I'm going to zoom up on the image and scoot over because each one of these have different step wedges that we want to be able to see between the various numbers. And if you can't see this, you might not be able to see it on the internet, but I can see it clearly on my display. As a matter of fact, you can go to my website, which happens to be edytap.com, and click on the eTechniques button. And here you can download this tonal range chart. As a matter of fact, you can also download the 90% method which is something we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Let's take a look at the shadow region as well on the other side. We want to see the step wedges. And the numbers that I have here go from 0 to 100%, but they also go from 0 to 255, which is the scale that we use to read uh, image data in Photoshop. So with that in mind, let me bring up this next image and I want to remove this particular layer for just a moment. I first want to talk to you about the printable uh, range of tone that we deal with with most of our images. I call this the 5 to 95 percent rule. As a matter of fact, you'll see where the uh, information starts about 5 percent and prints right up to about 95 percent. The truth is it's more like 3 to 97 in today's technology, but I call it the 5 to 95 percent rule. These are the range of tones that we can expect to see for reproduction. That printable range in the 8-bit uh, file is between 13, a value of 13, and 242. So if you'll keep that in mind, in just a minute, this printable range will make a lot of sense for you. I'm going to use this beautiful image of Joseph and Luis Simone, created by Don Blair, to explain uh, this particular uh, information. But before I do that, I'm going to go to my system preferences and bring up, let's check my sound, make sure it's up all the way. There we go. But I'm also going to click on displays. Why am I doing this? Because what we're going to study for this next hour is information that is absolutely critical to our viewing eye. And what I'm getting at here is the need to have our monitors properly calibrated. Of course, I use the Color Monkey Photo. It does an excellent job. It's easy to use, step by step. I'm going to click on the color here, and you can see I've created a uh, calibration. I've named it ET Passport Display D65. But your displays do not automatically calibrate. As a matter of fact, you just can't do color critical work without having a properly calibrated display. And suppose your monitor looked like this, and if it did, you would make all kinds of corrections to get the, the image warmer and color corrected uh, visually that just aren't right. As a matter of fact, here's an overly saturated uh, profile. So you can see there's differences in, with the different profiles, but the only way to make sure you have an accurate display is to properly, there's an adjective for you, calibrate your display. So. This is the properly calibrated display. When we go in and make corrections, uh, tonal and color corrections, we can be assured of what we're looking at. There's no surprises when we get the images back from the lab. OK, let's go to uh, the layer panel. I'm in Photoshop, of course, and I'm going to the level adjustment. And what I want to do here is take a look at the printable range. We know it's between 13 and 242 on the scale of 255. 255 values. And the way we can see these instantly is to use the level command. I'm going to kind of fly this panel out for you. And by holding down the Option key, which is Alt key on Windows, we can click on the shadow slider. We have input and output here. We're going to be clicking on the shadow 
input slider, that's going to turn our image completely white. And if we take this up to the value in the little window just below the cursor reads 13, it's going to show us all the tonal values that might be blocked up when we go to print. So this allows us the opportunity to perhaps use something like the output level black slider. We can take this up to 13 and be assured that those tonal values are now going to print properly uh, when we use this particular uh, image. Now, if the areas that are blocked up are, are not important to you, then it really doesn't matter if they're blocked up. There's some areas that we don't particularly care if they block up or not. Now, in the highlight region, we do the exact same thing by holding down the Option key, which is Alt on Windows, click and hold on the highlight slider. We can then bring this in to around 242, the number just below the cursor, and see if any highlights are blowing out. And, of course, there aren't in this image. We'd have to go way over before we start to see the highlights here. So this is just checking your printable uh, tonal range of images. So that's a good start uh, and just good information to know. If you've got images that are blocking up, uh, this might be a technique or at least a method for you to see what we're doing there. What I'm going to share with you right now is perhaps the most important technique I can share with you. It's what I call the 90% method of uh, color correction. It's a technique that allows us to remove a color cast simply using uh, the numbers in the image itself. I'm going to open up this image of these cheerleaders and incidentally uh, this technique is for uh, JPEG files, not RAW files. You'll see in a few minutes where we use RAW files is so much easier to get the color right to start with. Of course I use the color checker passport that allows me to create profiles too, but to get in uh, when we're shooting raw, uh, that's a lot easier. This technique is something I'd like you to study because it will actually make you very sensitive to the digital information that's there. Well, what we're going to do is start out by going over to the tool panel and selecting the color sampler tool, which is a partner to the eyedropper tool. And when you select one of these tools, the first thing to do is to go up to the option bar and change the sample size from point sample which is default to a 5x5 five five average which gives you a much more accurate reading of the information we're working with. When you use this tool several things happen instantaneously. For instance I'm going to select a white zone in this case the white t-shirt and a black zone in this case the black tire. When I click the mouse it does several things simultaneously. It sets a target it brings out the info panel if it's not already out. And most importantly, it locks the values of red, green, and blue in the info panel for me. You can see this is set as one, and I'll do a close-up of this in just a moment. Next, I'll click on the black tire, and the numbers, once again, are locked in. So I've got a white zone, white t-shirt, and a black zone, the black tire. And what's really amazing is that the cheer mom that did this picture did not have the x right color checker. Can you believe that, or the passport? Well, this happens to be a scan, so and um, the color is way off anyway. I'm going to go to the layer panel and bring up an adjustment layer using levels. When I do color corrections on JPEG files, I will use levels. When I do tonal corrections, I'll use curves. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer so you can see what I'm doing. And then I'll back out so you can see the results here in just a moment. But what I'd like you to look at first are the red, green, and blue values in both the highlight, which is zone 1, and the shadow, zone 2. And what we're going to do to make this easy is simply match the values. My highlight value is 232, excuse me, 237 in the red. That's my highest value. My current lowest value is 19, and that's in the blue channel. All we have to do in the Levels command is to go to the various channels individually. So we want to match the highest value, which happens to be 237, in the red, and match that with the green and blue. We'll do that by going to the green channel. We're working with the white zone. So let's take the highlight slider and move it in toward the center of the histogram. 
until the number comes close to or matches our highest value, which is 237. I've got it to 238. That'll work just fine. Next, we're going to the blue channel and do the same thing. We'll take the highlight slider and move the slider in toward the middle of the histogram until the number in the info panel comes close to or reaches 237. Now, we can hold down the command key, which is control key on Windows, position our cursor over the highlight or shadow window, and click and drag using a scrubby slider, which gives us a little more accuracy. I just want to match the numbers just a little bit more. There's 237. So we've removed the color cast in the white. We'll look at that in just a second. Next, let's go and match the lowest value for the black zone. What used to be a 19 is now a 43. And our lowest current value happens to be 30. So all we're going to do now is take our blue channel and green channel, and that happens to be in the red channel, the 30, and take the shadow slider this time, bring the number close to 30, or right at it. Once again in the green channel, I'm taking the shadow slider in toward the middle of the histogram. And now if you look at the values, we're very close, 30, 31, 31. 237, 236, 237. Let's back out now, take a look at what's happened here. In the layer panel, I'll turn the visibility icon off, and you can see the before and after results of matching the numbers of the image that's here. And what I'm talking about there is what I call creating a zone, selecting a white zone and a black zone, which is very close to white point, black point correction. The biggest difference here is we're going to match the numeric values that are already resonant in the file opposed to forcing a white or black zone to a given set of numbers, thereby maintaining as much detail as this file will allow us to um, have. Because when we have JPEG files, or in this case a scan, we have a limited amount of information that we're working with. Well, now that we have a properly calibrated display, we can make some subjective enhancements and what's happened between the correction is the red fire engine has gone completely overly saturated. So by using another adjustment layer with, say, hue and saturation, we can then select the reds of the image and just desaturate the reds themselves until we visually can come close to a much uh, visually pleasing red and, of course, the orange uh, Schwartz as well. And there's one more thing I want to do with this particular image, and that's to add a little bit of, of detail back into the white t-shirts. Well, there's plenty of printable detail. As a matter of fact, if I click on this little icon here, I'll zoom up for you. If I click on this little uh, thumbnail icon of the eyedropper, I can switch this over to a grayscale reading. And this goes from RGB to grayscale. What this shows me is we have a 9% uh, printable dot, which is good. That's in the 5 to 95% rule. I still want to add more detail, and a, f a quick and easy way to do that, once again using an adjustment layer, I'm going to use selective color. I jumped ahead of myself there. Selective color, and in the color pull-down menu, I'll select whites because we want to add information to the white of the image, and even though we're working in an RGB file, we have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black controls. So in the whites, we're going to add black. And here's the difference before and after adding black, and if you look in the number in the uh, info panel, we went from 9% printable information to up to 16%. So actually being able to add uh, more printable information to an area that had good detail to start with. This is where we started, and this is where we finish, uh, finished using the 90% method of color correction. Now, once again, this method is on my website and downloadable step by step. The 90% method, I encourage you to download that and study this technique. And when you have a serious file, a serious problem uh, with color, in a file. This method will remove a color cast better than any other method I've tried uh, since I've been doing digital. And quite frankly, I've been using this particular technique uh, since I switched over to digital from film, which was 19, 
93, and I know that some of you weren't born then, but it's been around for a while. The same thing very quickly, I'm going to select the x right color checker white patch and black patch. This gives me a pure zone. This is the purest zone you can have. And if we match the numbers once again, I'll do that very quickly using levels. We'll simply go to the highest values, 251 in the blue channel. So we'll go to the red channel. And I'll use Scrubby this time to take the number up to 251. That would be in the red channel. Now the green channel to 251. We've removed the color cast from the white zone. The lowest, we always match to the highest value for the white zone and the lowest value for the black zone. The lowest value is in the red channel. It happens to be 34. Let's take the green down to 34. And now the blue down to 34. And as you'll see in a minute, if we're shooting raw, we wouldn't have to do this at all. As a matter of fact, it's so much easier. But this is before and after uh, the 90% method using this technique with the, with the x right color checker. Eddie, we've got a really good question here. OK, go ahead. What do you do if there is no true white, white or black in the image? That's an excellent question, and now you know why I call this the 90% method. Because 10% of the time, you're not really going to have a white and a black zone to choose. If I were to choose this image created by Judy Host, my white zone is going to actually be on the inside with the light here. And the only black zone I could find in this image was right here on the eyebrow. And it's because of this very small area for the black zone that I, I might even change the sample size to a 3x3 three three average so it doesn't spill over into the skin tone. So that's an excellent question. But to answer your question, if we don't have a white and black resource, then we're going to switch over to what I call the 80% method. Now, the 80% method only works 80% of the time. And it's not by the numbers. It's very quick and it's very easy. And I'll show you how that works. We're also using an adjustment layer using levels. Only this time we're going to look at the histogram in the levels panel. I'm going to zoom up on the histogram for you and show you that we're going to go to each separate channel, the red, green, and blue individually, and we're going to look for what I call flatlining. If you look at the histogram mountain, when you get to the toe of the mountain, from here over, that's what I call flatlining. So to compensate for this, we're going to take the highlight slider and move it right to the toe of the mountain. And we're going to do that on each side for the shadow and the highlight. And we'll do that in each channel individually. So we'll take the shadow slider to the toe of the mountain here, maybe just a teeny bit here, and the, one more time in the blue channel. And once we have accomplished this, this will get you into a really good range of color 80% of the time. This is before and after, but this is also uh, the first step in this. The second stage in doing this type of correction is totally perceptual and it totally requires a properly calibrated display. And what we're going to do to do subjective enhancements here is use the gamma slider, the middle slider, in each of the channels. So we're going to move the slider in combination with red, green, and blue, and just takes a little bit of, of uh, experience just going through this and backing up and changing if you need to to get the color just where you want it. But this is the 80% method before and after without a white and black zone. Excellent question. Uh, outside of that, we go to the 70% method. <laughs> I really don't want to get into because it doesn't work that well, but it's using this middle grade eyedropper tool. So, you know, what we're going to learn in just a minute, we'll just we'll scoot around all this. Of course, th this is problem images. We all have some kind of problem images uh, for one reason or another, whether we create them or our clients send them to us. But this is uh, what this seminar is all about, is rescuing some of these problem images. Thank you for that wonderful question. Well, here we go. We have now some raw files to work with. I'm going to select both of these. And incidentally, the 90% method that we just learned is a technique that can only be done in 
Photoshop. It's a Photoshop specific technique. What we're going to do right now, I'm going to use Adobe Camera Raw. Let's go ahead and open these up in Adobe Camera Raw. But we can also do this exact same technique in Lightroom. So when I uh, photographed Christina, she had picked me up from the airport. We're rushing to a convention center to do a program. And we see this picture of this camera painted on the wall. And I said, stop the car, and it's like 20 degrees below zero. We jump out, shoot the image, jump back in the car, and I noticed that the color balance was way off. That's so unlike me to not do a proper white balance, but I did realize that, you know, this is a raw file, and watch how easy it's going to be to make this correction. In Adobe Camera Raw, I'm going to select this tool. It's called the White Balance Tool. And all we need to do now is click on something neutral, being gray, white, black. She was wearing a white coat. And there you go, one click of the mouse, and Christina's color uh, cast has been removed completely. We might change the exposure, add a little fill light perhaps. But you can see it was very easy to get this correction using raw, a raw file. So when we're shooting raw, even though we can make mistakes, when we recenter the color on a proper exposure, we still have original data here. It's a very healthy image with this technique. I'm starting to dive and work with Stephen Frank teaching underwater dive classes. And I asked one of my students to go down and shoot this chart. Uh, it's kind of like the chart we looked at when we first started. The only problem here is the image is actually overexposed. And that does generate a problem even when you're shooting raw. So we want to make sure uh, when we're sh shooting raw that we check the back of the camera, look at the histogram, and if we have any information climbing up the wall on the right-hand side, we're blowing out information. I'm going to get a little bit closer on the image here. And as I position my cursor over these patches, notice the numbers right here are reading 255, 255 and 255. The first, the last four patches are actually reading 255. That's completely blown out. There's no information. My shadow should read somewhere around 15 to 40, and it isn't. So we have a serious exposure problem here. So before we create a color correction, we need to add information in this raw file. I'm going to select the color sampler tool from the tool palette up here. And I'm going to click on this far white patch, which is reading 255. We can see the numbers now right here. At this point, I'm going to take my exposure down. As I'm looking at the numbers in the upper left, I want those numbers to be somewhere around 240, 242. There's 241. So now you can actually see there's actually some information up here. This is still blown out, but it's at this point that I have some tonal information in here that I can go back to the click balance, the white balance tool, and I'll click on this fourth gray patch, and you see it clears the color cast instantly. So it's very, very easy to get the color right from raw files, and as you'll see in a minute, if we get the right white balance using the passport color checker, we can get the color absolutely perfect in camera to start with, which is what our objective is. But looking at these images that need rescuing, these are some of the techniques that I wanted to share with you. I'm going to click Cancel here. And let's go to some other problem images. For instance, with this particular image, this was shot in a hotel I was staying at. And I was very anxious to get this particular image. A friend of mine is standing in the back there. Uh, Lee Veris is his name. A photographer, but when I shot this image, I used every means of white balance known to mankind to get the white balance just right, and it would not work. And it was so frustrating that I tried something, and the first thing I tried actually worked, but it was kind of off the cuff. So let me show you the correction, and I'll tell you uh, why it was doing this. I'm going to go to hue and saturation and take the hue to a minus 27 or so, and this is the actual color of these walls, the red and orange, if you will. This is the color it was supposed to be. I had to open my hotel door and look out the window, and I was amazed at how accurate this was. 
but I couldn't get it any other way. Any white balancing techniques simply wouldn't work. The 90% method wouldn't work. And the reason is, is because the uh, color of the lights were in the ultraviolet spectral of lighting. We have our infrared, our visible spectral of light, and then ultraviolet. And these lights were causing uh, the colors to be that far off. So by rotating the color using the hue, it really brought the colors in to play here. One more correction on this one is the, the whites in this image are not clean at all. So to clean these up, let's use a selective color adjustment that we looked at just a moment ago. And all I'm going to do here is select the whites because the whites are what I want to clean up. And I'm just going to remove all the color, the cyan, magenta, and yellow. And now you can see that the whites have been cleaned up very nicely in this image. So this is a problem with the color that has happened to me in my career three or four times. Not very often, but it was very frustrating uh, when that does happen. And I've come up with this correction, and I wanted to share it with you because uh, I was very excited about the results. Anyway, a question about, 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 about. Yes, you're you are very noisy. So um, I think Joe is replugging his mic in, and while he's doing that, we'll come back to your question in just a moment. But what we have here is somebody that has sunburned skin, and I wanted to show you a quick and easy correction for this sunburned skin. And what it is is once again using selective color. And yes, we're working in RGB file, red, green, and blue. And here we have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black controls. So I'm going to select the reds in the image, of course, his, his skin tone. And we're just going to add some cyan, remove some magenta, and add some yellow to get a much nicer, more pleasing skin tone. And I've done this selectively with group shots and that sort of thing. But anytime you create an adjustment layer in Photoshop, it automatically creates this layer mask for you. So before we do anything else, I'm going to fill this layer mask with black. And then by using white paint with my brush tool, I'll just paint over the areas. Let's see what I have here. Oh, with white paint. And we'll just paint over a skin tone so all the rest of the colors in the image stay true. And that's just another correction. Joe, are you back with me? Let me check something here. Okay. Um, I can't hear you. Let me see, Joe. Um, okay. I, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> So I'm going to continue on until Joe jumps back in. And if you need to call me, Joe, go ahead. I will wait. Um, you know, chime in, and then of course we'll get the questions that we have. Okay. Okay. There's a, there's a problem out there. Out there that this, I call I call color cross color cross over. Did you hear you jump back in there? Maybe not. Maybe not. Pardon me, pardon me. <laughs> pardon me, pardon me. Okay, okay. Oh, cross oh, cross oh, is okay. it? Is it? Oh, oh there, he is. there he is. Eddie, your uh, sound has gone uh, uh, scratchy. If you could plug in, uh, okay, plug, in, okay. plug back in. All righty, all righty. While Eddie is doing that, sorry about that. Sometimes people we ran into some bandwidth issues and the audio disappears for a second. But Eddie will be back shortly. In the meantime, Eddie is doing a lot of uh, color work in Photoshop. He mentioned the Passport. If anyone is interested in learning more about color workflow and the Color Checker Passport in both Lightroom and Photoshop, we have a free webinar scheduled for next Wednesday. So you can go to the X-Ray Photo website, click on the Learning tab, go under Webinars, and you can register for any of our free webinars there. So Eddie, I'll turn back to you. The sound sounds better now. OK, awesome. And let me set my levels here just a second. And Joe, did you say we had a question uh, in the wings there? Yeah, somebody had a question about uh, specifically what you do to meter to avoid having grossly overexposure or underexposure. Are you using your camera's meter or do you ever use a handheld meter? I, when 
when it's critical, I use a handheld meter to get uh, mostly do uh, uh, you know ambient readings of the light, and that's where I start. And I always look at the histogram, but um, I use a meter for critical work, yes, especially strobe and location. So it's pretty much all I do. Okay. Is that the uh, was that is that it? That's it for now. I'll carry on. Okay. Well, I, as you can see, I make mistakes, such as the one with Christina. Uh, so I've made serious mistakes when I was in a hurry, and uh, I think we all do. So that's the human part of us, and that's why I am introducing a lot of this work to a lot of you, or a lot of these techniques. What is color crossover? It's simply where you take a color and it changes into a different hue family. And we can do that so easily in just about any adjustment that we make in Photoshop under image adjustments. Most of these adjustments here, of course, are available as uh, adjustment layers. And what we want to do is use um, curves here. Excuse me for a second. I went to levels, didn't I? Let's go to curves. And what I'm going to do is generate or create a contrast curve. I'm going to the quarter tone and the highlight here, and going to the upper left, the quarter tone and the shadow. I'm going to the bottom right, creating an S curve. An S curve is a contrast curve. And if you look at the color, what it's done to the color, it's really taken the color into a different hue family. The color has crossed over. Well, it's very easy to fix this problem in the layer panel because we're using an adjustment layer. We're going to change the blend mode of this layer from normal all the way down at the bottom where it says luminosity. Well, this takes the color part out. So all we're using now is the luminous part of this adjustment, and the color crossover has been eliminated. So why am I showing you this? It's because a lot of the times we'll create adjustments. We'll create this color crossover, and we really won't notice it. I've made this example a little more exaggerated. And then we get the images back from our lab, and the color is not the way we thought it was. And this could be one of the reasons. So just be cautious when you're doing uh, corrections that your color crossover or your color stays intact. And one way to be certain of that is, again, to have a properly calibrated display. As photography is my livelihood, the only communication I have with my livelihood is my display, my monitor. So it's got to be properly calibrated so I can see what I'm doing properly. Fair enough. Okay. This is a, a technique that came from a question from the previous seminar. I thought I'd go ahead and open this image and show you how we open up shadows without uh, adjusting the highlights. And it's very simple to do, but there is a keyboard shortcut that you'll want to know. There's several different ones, actually. But the one I want to show you is holding down uh, the Command key, which is Control key on Windows, plus the Option key, Alt on Windows, Shift, and the number 3. So that would be Option, Command, Shift, 3. On the Windows, Alt, Control, Shift, 3. And what this does, it loads the highlight region. Well, what I'm going to do now is to invert the selection under Select Inverse. And now we're selecting the shadows, not the highlights. And we're going to use one of the most powerful controls there is in Photoshop, and that is called Exposure. Now I'm going to go over the Exposure control with you with a different image here in just a minute. But the reason this is so powerful is because we can change the exposure. In this case, we want to open up the gamma, which is midtone region. And all it's doing is opening the shadow and not the highlights. What's wonderful about using the exposure adjustment in Photoshop is that it is color safe. It's the only adjustment that you can do in Photoshop and change the tonal values that will not give you a color crossover. So it's a very safe to use when you need to make tonal adjustments. You can see the before and after using this adjustment, and there's no color crossover. Okay. 
Well, this brings me to the passport, the color checker passport, which is something I use now in everything I shoot. Every time I'm shooting a scene in the studio, in location, anywhere, I'm using the color checker passport because it's so easy to create a camera profile and apply that instantly to uh, my images. As a matter of fact, this is the color checker passport interface that we use for Photoshop. And you can see it, when we bring an image in, it automatically selects the patches. To create the profile, all we have to do is click Create Profile and name it, and it's done. It's that easy to create a profile, and I'm sure Joe will show that to you next week. Well, when I create the different profiles for uh, my shoots, we can do this uh, using the interface I just showed you, or we can do it directly in Lightroom, so in Lightroom or Photoshop. But what's really important is that we'll create a DNG file, create the profile, and then we'll open up our images. And I'll just select these images here. Of course, these are raw files. I'll open these up in Adobe Camera Raw. Just going to zoom up a little bit to show you so you can see the difference here. I'm going to go to this tab over here. It's called Calibration, Camera Calibration. And anytime we bring in a raw file, the name, the camera profile is Adobe Standard, which is very good, actually. But I just created the Buddha Lina Studio profile, just the way I showed you. And I want you to see the difference. This is before and after applying the profile to the uh, images. And what's so exciting about this is this really brought in the true color. As a matter of fact, my client was so excited they'd never seen the color of their products so true ever before, and they were just tickled. So by applying the profile, I can just select all here and apply the profile to all of them instantly. But the difference of using this and to show you the difference here to me is absolutely stunning and what more important is my client was absolutely beside themselves. So I'm excited to show you how easy it is to get it right to start with. But this is called image rescue for problem files. Those were not problem files. And this is the way I want to shoot every day. So I'm going to do my best <laughs> to make that happen. But I am human and I do make mistakes. And this next uh, technique I want to show you is what I call saving private JPEG. And what that is, this is a, a portrait created by Judy Host. This is a JPEG file, and when she shot this, as sometimes happens to me, you, you loan your camera to somebody or they show it or you're teaching a workshop, and somehow your camera gets set back to JPEG instead of RAW. Well, this is what we're gonna do to it using Adobe Camera Raw. And you can do TIFFs or JPEGs in Adobe Camera Raw, but the way I have it set up, uh, and incidentally, what I'm going to show you right now will do in Adobe Camera Raw, but you can do the exact same thing in Lightroom. There is no difference. But by holding down the Command key or the Control key and typing R, the JPEG file will open up directly in Adobe Camera Raw. So the first thing I want to do is open the exposure. I'm going to be looking in this area first. And now we've got a nice exposure. I'm now going to use the adjustment tool, the gradiated filter. And let's take the exposure to a minus one stop. And I'll just, uh, looks like I've got some in there. Let me clear that. Sorry about that. Now I'll click and drag the mouse to create a minus exposure at the bottom. And now we'll go to the adjustment brush. And we can do the same thing here. We can have plus or minus exposure and all these other options, which was also with the gradient filter, brightness, contrast, clarity, saturation, sharpness, and color. And there's controls for your edge of the brush. But what we can do here is also uh, selectively tone down different areas of the image. And let's create a new one. And we'll go to the plus exposure and sometimes we want to brighten up just certain faces here and there. So what I'll do to finish this image, I'll go back to select the eyedropper tool. This will take me back to my tabbed uh, areas. And I will also go to detail. Excuse me. Uh, that was noise reduction. There we go. Lens correction tab. 
And I'm going to use the post crop vignetting, and that will create a vignette around the image. So this is one way that we can take JPEG files and use the powerful features in Adobe Camera Raw, which are also in Lightroom, to make corrections like this, and they're totally non-destructive. If you use Adobe Camera Raw this way, uh, what you can do is click on Save Image, and you can save this as a JPEG, TIFF, or even Photoshop-type file, or digital negative, and all of these adjustments will be saved into that file. If I click Done here, there's a sidecar file. You might have seen this update very quickly. But a sidecar file has been created, but the original JPEG file, without any of these adjustments, is still in this particular file. So we can always go back to the JPEG file with no adjustments, but by uh, saving the file out to a JPEG or a TIFF file, we can save those adjustments right into the file, such as this one was done. Tone control. I'm going to open this image up with my buddy uh, Ken. And this is one of those instances where my camera had been set to JPEG uh, accidentally. So I like getting a lot of detail information in my file, but this is just too dark. So to open up the tonal values, I'm going to use the most powerful adjustment panel in Photoshop, and that is the exposure control. And why is that? It's because it doesn't generate a color crossover. I can open up the exposure. I can open up the midtones or gamma. And the offset, let me do a little close-up here so you can see this. Exposure, gamma, and offset. The offset will add a little punch back into the image. It'll add contrast. But if you use the slider here, it goes too far too fast. You can see where that went just too far too fast. That's why I love using the uh, scrubby slider in Photoshop. And what is the scrubby slider? When you position your cursor over the name, gamma, offset, or exposure, and you've seen me do that over the windows before, we now have about a tremendous amount of control with the slider. Instead of using the slider here, we use the scrubby slider. It gives us a lot more control. Now it punches back in. The only change I would make here would be to select the layer mask. And I'll go ahead and anytime you create an adjustment layer, Photoshop gives you a layer mask. And by using black paint, and let's go down to about 50% opacity, I'll just go ahead and paint back over Ken's sweater to add a little more detail. So this is before and after. Opening up this information, there's no color crossover issues with exposure control, and it gives me just the right tones that I'm looking for. Okay. Um, I think that's the primary elements I wanted to share with you today. Um, Joe, do we have any questions on the table? No, I've been answering the questions on the fly as they come through. <clears throat> okay. Uh, mostly, of course, as usual, everyone would like to have you personally come visit their studio and help them out. <laughs> that that but, can be arranged. <laughs> since that probably isn't easily accomplished. Um, we will get to everyone's questions as they are coming in. Now, uh, everybody has been uh, commenting on how wonderful the techniques you've shown have been. Uh, uh, well, I, too, thank have you. been doing Photoshop for many years, and every time I hear you, I always learn something new. Uh, there well, was one you, question, though. Uh, people are a little confused over exactly what color crossover is. Okay. That's a, a, a valid concern, and let me explain this the best way I can. Um, I'm going to open up this image of Andy once again. And what I'm going to do is take the eyedropper tool, and I'm going to click on this cheek. Actually, let me start out with the color sampler tool. I'll click on this cheek to set a sample point. Uh, am I on the wrong layer or something? No. Okay. So I'll just take the eyedropper tool. And I'm going to click on this sampler right here. That puts his skin tone in the foreground color. Next, I'll go ahead and create a um, color crossover problem. And I'm just doing this directly on the image, not on an adjustment layer. 
and I'm going to switch this over and read the same reading. So now we have the same color twice. The first thing I'm going to do is click on the background color, which was the original skin tone. And in the color picker, I'm going to highlight the locator, the numeric locator of this color. Of course, this is the location of the luminance, chrominance, and hue, saturation, and brightness. So I'm copying this in the memory, just you know, Command C, and click Cancel. Next, I'm going to click on the saturated color, and I'm going to highlight and paste this in. Before I do that, if you look at this bar here, this is the different color families. If I were to click and drag this along, it'll change from one color family to another color family. What is a color family? This big box is a color family. We have the color and we have the uh, saturation, brightness, and hue of this color. When I paste this, and I'll do this now, I want you to watch this bar change. Boom. It just changed a little bit, but what happened? This bar went to a different color family. That's what I call digital color crossover. When we do that on the entire image, the color crosses over everywhere. So this is before and after. So now that I've done this on the image itself, I can simply go to fade curves. And guess what? We can choose luminosity to fade it to. So we can also eliminate the color this way. Another way to eliminate the possibility of color crossover is to convert your file to the LAB mode, select the lightness channel, create your tonal corrections, and that will eliminate any possibility of a color crossover. And one more thing, talking about color crossover issues, Photoshop has brilliantly added features in tools, such as the Burn and Dodge tool today have a feature that is called Protect Tones. The Protect Tones option with the Burn and Dodge tool allow you to do just that. You can burn and dodge and there is no color crossover uh, using Protect Home. So that's a wonderful feature in Photoshop. Good question, thank you. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Well everybody's asking about uh, they want to be able to watch this again and I have sent out the type message but just to let everyone know uh, no later than Monday, this recorded presentation will be available on xrightphoto.com. Just go to the Learning tab under Webinars, scroll down to the bottom, and there's a link to archived webinars, and that's where it will be. Uh, Eddie, I don't know if this is going too much into Photoshop editing, uh, but somebody is asking if there's an easy way to crop a person and change the background. I'm not sure if they need color or put a new background in, though. Well, let's just answer that by doing just that. And I'm going to go to the easy part of doing that, okay? <laughs> is it easy to do that? The answer is yes and no. It's, uh, it's easy to uh, change backgrounds, but everything depends on the edge. And I'm going to show you uh, one of the images I teach with to teach how to do that. Photoshop is a masking program. As a matter of fact, that's what Photoshop's brilliance is, is masking, the ability to mask areas. So I'm going to take this green screen background, if you will, and show you a masking technique in Photoshop that's very, very wonderful. Now, uh, one of the things to keep in mind is that generally I would use a multitude of different masking techniques. In Photoshop CS4, we have the mask panel, which allows us to do several things. Let me bring out the layer panel before I do this. I'll stick this up here. And with the mask panel, if we click on this button, button, if we click on this button right here, it does several things instantly for us. The first thing it does, it converts our background to a floating layer. And the second thing it does, it adds a layer mask to that layer. And it's from this panel, the mask panel, then we can also click on the color range option, which of course is available under select color range. But this gives us a new feature because this instantly creates a mask, uh, the layer mask for us. So what I'm going to do is set the fuzzy to 40, which is a default setting. And I always set the fuzziness to 40. And I'm going to click on the green background and hold down the shift key and click on the other values, both in the picture 
and maybe in the little graphic here, to try to create as much of a mask as I can. And now I'm going to take the fuzzy slider back up. And what does the fuzzy slider do? Well, it doesn't make anything fuzzy, but what it does, in my opinion, it kind of wraps around the edges of your image where there's kind of a, a delineation of, of color. So you can see his hair is kind of fading in. I don't want to take it up too far, but I do want to get that little wraparound feature. And this easily and this quickly, by using the mask panel, I've been able to mask out the background extraordinarily fast and pretty accurately as well. So what we're going to do next is take the Move tool, and we'll just move Peter onto this background that we've prepared for him. And if we look at this at 100% zoom ratio, you can see it, it's done a pretty awesome job of bringing this image into a new background. But there is one issue, you might be able to see it, it's that color fringing. So to get the green out of his hair, we're going to use a simple technique using Photoshop's brush tool and changing the blend mode from normal down to where it says color. What this will do for the brush, it will convert it over from simply a brush tool to a colorization tool. So anytime you're in the brush tool, the brush tool uses the foreground color. That means you can hold down the Option key, which is Alt key on Windows, and click on the color that you want to paint with. Well, I want to paint with his, his nice grayish hair. So Option click here. This will position his hair color in the foreground. I'm in the color blend mode. And just for the sake of, of everything, let's put this at 100% opacity. And now I'm just going to go ahead and wash that green right out of his hair. Now, when we get to the skin over here, I'll option click on his skin tone. Let's get a smaller brush. And there's a little green fringe. You might not be able to see it. I can see it here. But that's gone. And the same thing with the blue sweater. That little green fringe is now gone. So to, there's ways to... Um, remove the fringes in the interface, quite frankly, but to me this is much faster and easier and the control to me is just a lot better. So this is one way that we can put somebody into a new background. The reason I'm showing you this is because it's um, one of the many ways. So we use this technique in combination with a variety of other techniques. Masking is the means blending is the key and if you want to become proficient at Photoshop you want to become what I call a blender you want to learn how to blend because that is uh, how we master this wonderful program Photoshop thank you for the question well Eddie I'm sure everybody's brains are full at this point uh, you've covered an incredible amount of material in a short period of time this last demonstration was just truly amazing uh, oh, thank you saying basically amazing <laughs> Well, thank you all, and, and what an honor and a privilege to be here uh, working with you, and, and thank you for your questions. Do we have more? Uh, mostly people asking which parts of this are limited to CS4 for those that are still CS3 users. Uh, CS4 brought in the masks panel, but the technique itself can be done in any version. Um, there's nothing I've shown you today that can't be done in practically any version of Photoshop, especially the color issues. I don't remember when exposure became available, but it's been there. But I can tell you this. Each time Adobe releases a version of Photoshop, something brilliant comes with it. For instance, in CS4, we had the protect tones with the burn and dodge tools. So that every version brings something that makes life easier when we need to do our masking and blending. And I love Lightroom too, but Photoshop is my choice for doing these troubleshooting uh, images, rescuing these images. Well, I'm with you, Eddie. I uh, use them both myself, and the stuff that you show in Photoshop, again, never stops to amaze me as well. Well, thank you, Joe. All right, so I'm sure you would love to all have Eddie come visit you personally, but we have run out of time for today. So we do need to close for the day. But just a couple of closing 
words that we'd like to let you know about. First of all, yeah, we have seen an incredible amount of information today, and I would like to thank Eddie Tapp on the behalf of Mac Group for sharing his incredible breadth of knowledge and talents with us. To see what else he is up to and to see his complete schedule of events, please visit his website and his blog at www.eddietapp.com. Also, if you'd like more information, including videos, brochures, and technical information on the x ray products that Eddie used, please visit xrightphoto.com. If you have any specific questions that didn't get answered, feel free to send me an email directly offline at joeb at macgroupus. I would also like to let everyone know that Eddie is offering a five-day workshop from April 19th through the 23rd in Maui. This workshop also features Judy Host and Randy Hufford. So go to eddietap.com to see all the details of this fantastic learning opportunity. Now, a lot of people did ask calibration questions. If you're interested in learning more about how to get your color under control in just one click, we're doing a detailed webinar on the Color Checker Passport in both Lightroom and Photoshop next Wednesday. It's a free webinar. You can register at xrightphoto.com. Go to the Learning tab, click on Webinar, and register. So thank you all for attending. Thank you again to Eddie Tapp, and we hope to spend time with you again soon. Have a great day, everyone.